This show is listener supported. You can join us and help our show grow to support more adoptees by going to adoptiesoncom slash partner. You are listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. This is episode 153, Claire. I'm your host, Haley Radke. Today, we welcome Claire, the creator of How to Be Adopted. Claire shares with us about having postnatal depression when she had her son, which was wrapped up in her process of coming out of the fog. We also talk about how she called out a popular adoptee reunion TV show for their inaccurate portrayal of reunions, and we discuss the state of care in the UK, how she connects with her nieces and nephews who have experience in that system, and what supports there are for adult adoptees. We wrap up with some recommended resources, and as always, links to everything we'll be talking about today are on the website adopteeson.com. Let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome to Adoptees On, Claire. Welcome, Claire. Hi, Haley. Thank you for having me. Okay, so I'm going to gush a little bit, okay? Claire is a longtime supporter of the podcast, long time, and has been one of my biggest cheerleaders and stepped in in uh, dire situations <laughs> for me a couple times. And I can't believe it has taken us this long to go on the main feed and record together. So I'm so grateful that you are stepping out, being feeling brave today and uh, sharing your story with us. And thank you so much for all your support. It's been really wonderful to have you as a cheerleader. Well, thank you, Haley. That means a lot. And, you know, the feeling is more than mutual. (laughs) Why don't you start the way we usually do and share your story with us? So I was adopted in 1979. I was born to teenagers, June and Rob, who were having a relationship but decided um, they wouldn't keep me. It was a private adoption and I was adopted by Denise and Harry, who had been married for 10 years and spent those 10 years trying for a baby. So that was kind of the story that I was given as I was growing up. That was how very, very wanted that I was and very cherished when I arrived. And ironically, we ended up in a family of six. So my parents adopted another little girl about a year later. And then they had a son and a daughter who were biological. So it was a very busy household with the six of us. We also had lots of pets. My friends always said they used to love coming around because it was such a fun, noisy, crazy household. Um, and yeah, I was pretty, pretty happy, grateful adoptee, the standard. So the only kind of, I suppose, thing that kind of stands out now looking back would be that my sister, um, who was adopted, was was very troubled. But I think that um, it's only now that I'm out of the fog that I can see that. So at the time, she was kind of labelled naughty and we just kind of accepted that. So really, really super interesting when I read The Primal Wound and Coming Home to Self by Nancy Verrier. She talks about how often if there are two children adopted into the same family, um, one tends to fit the good adoptee mould and one tends to fit the um, naughty or disruptive adoptee mould. So I found that actually quite eye-opening when I read that as an adult. So I kind of, yeah, went through my teens and 20s. I was um, I was a good adoptee. So, of course, I had a good adolescence, brought home perfect grades, um, went off to uni, got a good job. I didn't really kind of notice any issues. But obviously, looking back, um, I've always had anxiety. I think my mum said that it, I was around three when she first noticed that I was highly anxious. But I guess I was just told, you know, you're just quite highly strung. You need to relax. You need to chill out stop overthinking things. Um, That's kind of, yeah. Does that help telling an uh, anxious person that? Just relax. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, and I can testify it also doesn't help in childbirth either. (laughs) 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 So yeah, I had a bit of insomnia. I think um, my mum took me to the doctor when I was maybe nine or ten. And she said, look, my daughter's only sleeping five or six hours a night is that enough and the GP said well Margaret Thatcher only sleeps four and a half so 
not a problem. <laughs> These are all hilarious anecdotes, obviously, in my family. And the only other thing I kind of maybe worth mentioning is that I had a lot of anxiety around friendships. So I kind of have quite a few kind of standout moments where I was very, very clingy around friends and friends had to kind of make quite strict agreements with me about the kind of parameters of our friendship and to kind of sign agreements to say that I was their best friend and they wouldn't be friends with anyone else and they'd always invite me to their parties. And <laughs> yeah, but I didn't know that was abnormal because... <laughs> To lock it down. (laughs) (laughs) And kind of, I suppose, if I'm honest, I then was very similar when I started dating and having boyfriends. So, yeah, kind of, I think what they would call a psycho girlfriend um, in in bro movies. But, um, (laughs) um, But as I said, I was in the fog. So, you know, all of this is only apparent when you look back at it. Mm-hmm. kind of with that lens so yeah I guess that's kind of my pre-fog years I had my reunion quite early so I didn't realize that um, a lot of people don't actually kind of start searching and reuniting until later life I found my birth mother when I was um, around 18 19 and we met when I was about 21 and then I found my birth father or my bio dad as I call him Um, mid-twenties so um, from speaking to other adoptees that I feel like that is fairly young Um, so as I said I was in the fog so obviously the reunion went really well because I was super lovely and you know acceptable and didn't cause any any problems so yeah we kind of just took it quite slow and steady and I was kind of really proud that I had these successful reunions possibly even smug I would say, looking back. (laughs) So I apologize to um, anyone who appeared to be smug because it didn't really, the harmony didn't really last. So once I came out of the fog, there were definitely a lot of issues. So did you have just a curiosity about who your biological parents were? What made you go ahead and look? Sure. So I had always been curious and I kind of decided from a really young age that nothing would stop me and I would look as soon as I could, which is 18 in the UK. And with my bio dad, the only reason that was later is because his name wasn't on my birth certificate. So I had to wait until I got that name from my birth mum. And I guess I told myself that the reason I was searching was, you know, for health information, see who I look like, where did I get my knobbly knees, this kind of thing. And I also had a burning desire to let them both know that they'd made the right decision and I was extremely happy and we could all pat ourselves on the back for a successful adoption, (laughs) which is probably one of the first things out of my mouth after we met, which was, yeah, don't worry, made the right choice, I've had a great life and just kind of offering them that gift that I felt that I wanted to offer. Mm-hmm. Um, I even I even took my birth mum a bunch of flowers. <laughs> I think it's common for a lot of us who reach out via letter or I guess email or what, what do you do now? Snapchat them. It's so common for us to express those feelings of gratitude right at the beginning because it's like maybe then they'll still talk to me. I don't know because... No one's going to send the first contact and be like, how, how could you do this? You know, anyway, that's an aside. OK, so you met and you said you, you had a bit of a reunion that you were like could be smug about and then things more got real. Yeah, I mean, I guess it was only when I had my my son. So I was sort of early 30s. I guess I started coming out of the fog when I was pregnant with my son, which I have documented. I think we spoke briefly on the, in the off script and I've been um, interviewed about my postnatal depression which I'm really really happy to share because I think that at the time I couldn't find anything at all out there I couldn't find a decent therapist I didn't know what was happening to me I just felt really really unusual really odd my husband was struggling to support me uh, and I actually pre- I actually googled pregnant and adopted and all I could find was things for people who are pregnant and considering 
adoption. So that wasn't great. So I kind of, I suppose subconsciously at that moment, I made it my mission to almost be that resource in the future for people like myself. And it took me, you know, it took me a few more years to actually get there. But I think that's when the first kind of seed was planted about the blog and, you know, how I wanted to sort of help other adoptees. So then once he was born, you know, just a lot of things coming to the surface around abandonment. And I think there's kind of like a before and after where before you can convince yourself that babies don't remember anything and that babies are blank slates. And then once you have a baby, you kind of realize that that's not true. And I just, I mean, I only, I think I was adopted. I left hospital at, I think about 16 days old and went to my adopted family. So as I grew up, I think those 16 days were really minimized. And obviously I, I always knew that other, other children had been in foster care or been adopted much later. And so I always kind of thought of myself as not having a reason to ponder over those days because they were only a few days. But then once I had my son and I realized that 16 days is actually a really long time and all of the stuff that we went through together as mother and son in those 16 days and all of those hours and minutes spent together, I guess that's when it was really starting to hit home. Obviously, along with the pregnancy, you know, you're told, oh, the baby can hear your voice now and the baby knows what you're feeling. And just kind of, I suppose I just came to accept that I didn't have the most relaxed, nicest kind of start in life because of my birth mother would have had a pretty anxious pregnancy. And I know she's told me she had a really, it was a really, really awful traumatic birth. So I guess I came to accept that. And then part of the issue was that other people around me didn't. So I started to kind of feel like I only really wanted to spend time with people who got it. And it was too exhausting and emotionally overwhelming to try and almost convince other people. And I didn't really, I couldn't really have small talk with anyone. I couldn't really go and do like social stuff. And I suppose it was probably a form of grief that I was experiencing for a number of years, which obviously coincided with having a small child. And it's not that we didn't have lovely moments. I think I was just, as you say, emerging gradually over those few years. Uh, And then my daughter was born a couple of years later. Uh, And then the blog was born a few years after that. During your second pregnancy with your daughter, did you have some of those same feelings that you did when you were pregnant with your son? Like, were you wondering about little Claire and how she was um, in utero and when you were born? Those kind of things that come back again? I would say it came back, but I would say it was to a much lesser extent. So I would say it was a lot more intense um, with my son. And with my daughter, I kind of was a lot stronger in terms of what I what I wanted from the birth, the pregnancy and the kind of postpartum period. Um, so with my son, I kind of almost let things happen to me and let kind of got swept away with the professionals and the white coat syndrome. Um, whereas with my daughter, we used our savings to hire a doula and we explained everything to the doula and they completely got it. It wasn't like, you know, like the more traditional Western medicine where the doctors were kind of like, bish bash bosh get them in get them out we don't want to hit you know I don't really care about anything emotional and they really really led me through such a lovely pregnancy and they yeah they were just kind of saying to me you can ask for the birth that you want and you can ask to hold the baby straight away because I didn't hold my son straight away and it was important to me but I didn't feel empowered to ask so with my daughter I was really really like clear that that's what I needed because I had obviously experienced separation So I kind of almost, I don't know, like I wanted to say it was quite spiritual. I guess it was. I kind of almost felt like it was an experience, like an opportunity to heal when I had my daughter. So I kind of almost used it as a, a positive experience. I love that, that you were able to reclaim something that might have feeling like it was stolen when you were first going through that with your son. Okay, so you mentioned a couple of times. So you have a blog called How to Be Adopted. 
And there's other things coming as well. We'll get to that in a bit. But can you talk about coming out of the fog, looking for resources, not finding what you're needing in the moment? And then where where does that come in where you're like, okay, well, I just have to make something myself, obviously, because other people have got to be feeling like me. I guess, I, as I said, I kind of realized when I was pregnant that there wasn't a lot necessarily out there for adoptees. The one thing I did find was a London support group, which actually has been running now for 10 years, which is, is amazing because I've been in London that whole time and didn't know about it. So it's a group that is run, it's kind of supported by a network of local authorities and it's, as I said, it's been going 10 years and there are adoptees from 20, from their in their 20s up to their 70s. So it's a huge range. Um, and I didn't know when I found it that it's um, one of only two or three in the UK, which is absolutely shocking. And, you know, that's on my that's on my to-do list to get one in every town <laughs> up and down the land. So that was, that was amazing. And I think I, I joined that group around the same time that I discovered adoptees on. So I would say that sort of 2017 was like emotionally like a pretty huge year for me. Like I remember when I first heard your podcast and I was just stopped in my tracks, just tears just flowing and flowing and flowing. Just that feeling of being understood and somebody else putting into words something that you didn't even know you were allowed to think, let alone say. It's just so, so powerful. So thank you. Yeah, and so kind of coupled with the group, I guess that was kind of the springboard um, and lots of resources, obviously, that you recommended, um, like the wonderful Anne Heffron and her book, You Don't Look Adopted. And there was one conference I went to in London, which um, run by a charity called The Open Nest, who are really wonderful. And they don't, they're completely independent. So they're not in any way influenced by adoption policymakers, um, which I think is really important, especially in the UK at the moment. They were running a conference which was dedicated to adoptees and people who had been in the care system. So only those people spoke on the day, which was absolutely so powerful. And I must remember when I meet when I meet people now where it's their first event or their first group, I have to remember that that was my first one. And I was shaking like a leaf. I was nearly sick in the in the toilets beforehand. (laughs) And I wasn't even speaking. I was just listening. So I must remember like that's. Yeah, that's kind of how a lot of us do feel when we we finally kind of stumble on this this kind of hidden community. So yeah, that was my kind of journey, I guess. And I just said to my husband, I I just want to help one other person. That's you know that's my kind of aim. If I can just help one person not to go through what I went through, that's my aim. And he he laughs now because he sees me kind of beavering away on my my blog post and my Twitter and he says, oh, how many people have you helped now? And I had a check before today I spoke to you and it's um, 32 and a half thousand. So that's, (laughs) that's, you know, that's something I'm very, yeah, very happy. Congratulations. Well done. My word. Thank you. (laughs) You know, every time I see a download number or you see that, um, counter on your website on the back end. We don't do those on the front anymore, do we? But um, <laughs> it's like that represents one person. It's it's amazing. And you wrote a uh, critical open letter to the TV show Long Lost Family, which if you haven't seen that, I'm sure you can picture what that looks like. Um, you want to describe it for it's like a reunion show, right? Like the classic find your birth parents here's the airport moment or it's in a park or I'm you know one of those sorts of things uh do you want to just talk a little bit about that and then the response that you got yeah sure so I think I kind of alluded to the fact that my reunion kind of went as we say in Britain Pete Tong um meaning wrong um (laughs) it yeah it kind of went that's the polite version of saying that it kind of went yeah Mm. South, shall we say, um, around the time that I was coming out of the fog. So I was kind of probably just kind of feeling, you know, this show is not an accurate representation of reunion and something needs to be said. 
And, you know, and my husband will testify that it was due to it was due to air at 9 p.m. that evening. And I thought if I can get the blog ready and up by 9 p.m., then I can obviously jump on the hashtag when people are watching and on their phones at the same time. So there's like steam literally coming off the keyboard and I'm bashing away like point one, point two, point another thing. <laughs> like just, um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I read it back now and, you know, I think I'm still pretty measured, but I guess you can tell that I'm a bit peed off. I just think it's, I think what I've learned, so the producer of the show contacted me with a response to the letter and kind of went through point by point, which I really appreciate. But I think that the conclusion I've come to is that these shows are kind of not for us. So they're they're about us, but they're not for us. So we're not the intended audience. So in other words, we may have feedback or critique, but that's actually kind of not really wanted because the format works. It's extremely popular. And I guess I guess I just hope I live in hope that one day there'll be shows that actually speak to us and um, that actually we can relate to. Well, and I, I really did appreciate you writing that letter and pointing out some of the flaws. And for years, I've called that type of show reunion porn because it does mostly just highlight that airport moment that everyone wants to see. And I agree with you. It's not for us. It's not the reality. And that's one of the reasons that it's so helpful for adoptees to talk to each other and share our real life experiences, (laughs) you know, and especially years on in the process. You know, a lot of us did have a very happy honeymoon period in those first few months. And you don't expect to see troubles coming down the road. So I think it's so helpful for, you know, someone like you writing your blog and sharing those really hard and real things. So adoptees that are coming through our same (laughs) footsteps later on after us can say, okay, I can see, you know, I've got my glasses on. I can see what are the things I could possibly Um, expect and you can kind of prepare yourself a little more than just going in with like okay I'm about to get my flowers at the bottom of the escalator and everything's good (laughs) it's just not real and you have had experiences with um, some other types of adoption and foster care what do you call it in the UK just the care system yeah so they you would say that you were care experienced if you if you had been in the care system so you have experiences with different parts of the care system in the UK which is a little different than over here and in Canada and the US is different as well but um, can you share a little bit of that because I also have learned a lot from you you're very outspoken on Twitter and calling things out when you see there needs to be reform. And with someone that has such close ties, um, I think your, you know, your voice is so important in that area. Earlier, I mentioned that I have a sister who my parents adopted about a year or so after they adopted me. So we're not biologically related. And she was actually placed in a children's home as a baby for a few months uh, before she came to us. I kind of say that to kind of give you an idea of um, sort of potential attachment challenges that she faced in our family. So at the age of around 14, I think the professional term is adoption disruption. So the adoption broke down in the sense that she went into what was originally respite care and she didn't come back to the family. So in the subsequent years, she had... Um, a number of babies who obviously my nieces and nephews who I love dearly and they are now in a mix of different care situations so there's kinship care which means being with a family member um, being raised by a family member who's not your parent foster care as we've mentioned so that's somebody who's paid to look after you and adoption so I have tried my 
hardest to um, keep in touch with my nieces and nephews over the years. And um, in some cases, it's been fairly easy. So one of my nieces, I'm her godmother and um, we see each other regularly. But for example, one of my nephews was placed in a closed adoption um, and I have annual letterbox contact with him. So what that means is that I write a letter once a year, which goes via a social worker and eventually goes to him. So when he was small, it went to his parents and now it goes to him. And then he sends back um, a letter and some photos. So I guess it's worth kind of pointing out that because I'm adopted, I'm not actually biologically related to any of my sister's children. But I made the decision that it was important, not only because I love them, but it was important for them um, that they had a link that was left open because of my sister's situation. I didn't know whether she would be in a position to give them any information that they might might need or want. Um, so I kind of made the memory books um, with pictures of my sister as a baby and growing up. And I put in there things like the hobbies that she was into and the music that she was into because I wanted them to have an additional kind of source other than their records which when they get their records they're not going to really make for very very nice reading so I it's not that I wanted to whitewash the reality I just kind of you know at the end of the day I think my sister you know we're all people we're all human and there are lots of like really cute and lovely things about her that would be lost if they just based you know their findings on what a social worker wrote down about my sister one day in a meeting So that's kind of where I was coming from with them. And I guess it's kind of led me to become, as you say, a bit outspoken and being asked to speak and present about the the, my experience with this letterbox contact. So I did quite a kind of scathing um, review of how, what I think about letterbox contact um, in, a, in a talk earlier this year. And I kind of just said, you know, for a start, it's not a contemporary way that people communicate anymore. I'm their aunt. I'm a really I'm a safe person. I was with them a lot when they were small. It doesn't really, in hindsight, makes no sense really as to why um, I was just offered an annual letter. You know, I was very close in particular to to a couple of them, like super close we saw each other all the time and um, they called me aunt care because they couldn't say claire so it was like super super cute now not only from the point of view of having somebody in their first family that they can ask questions if they need to you know i'm not forcing a relationship but they've got that option but then i honed in on the fact that these siblings are, have all been separated and that they are now going to find each other on social media with no support, um, no help, no guidance, and just go off on their own as teenagers and try and form these relationships with one another, which I think is unacceptable. I think it's unacceptable, number one, to split up siblings, brothers and sisters. And if you really, really have to, then the, the, those links need to be maintained. And I don't think there is any reason or any excuse why those links cannot be maintained and those relationships cannot be nurtured so that then when they become adults they've got the option to then take those relationships on because brothers and sisters are there for life and even if you don't get on when you're little doesn't mean it kind of doesn't mean you kind of write that off um, and don't give those children a choice or an option Um, so yeah so I feel pretty strongly about that and I hope I've got my I've got my niece's permission to talk about it and they really really want change and my niece said to me she doesn't think that anybody except an adopted person should make a decision on who adopts wise little person there my goodness thank you for sharing that i was getting super emotional while you were talking through that can you tell us uh, a little bit about your sister you have some really powerful posts and um letters about that on your blog that I was um, rereading today. And yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that? So yeah, so thinking about my sister and her situation, I regret that she didn't stay in the family. And I obviously regret that I didn't kind of realize at the time that that's kind of where things were kind of headed. Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of therapy I understand that it's not my fault. I understand I was also a child at the time. But, you know, I we, I mean, she hasn't been actively a member of the family probably since, 
I don't know, maybe even 20 years, I guess, because I guess, you know, life goes on and she, she wasn't living locally, but you know, I've kept, I've kept trying to keep in touch over the years and support her, but due to her lifestyle, she kind of drops, drops in and out of contact. And I think, yeah, the, the post that you're probably referring to, I think it was a few Christmases ago. I, I didn't have any way to contact her. I didn't know if she was okay. So that was just my kind of thoughts and wishes that she was safe and well and that one day um you know we can just hang out together as sisters I would say as we used to but we fought like cat and dog when we were teenagers so (laughs) but no the last time I saw her um I guess it was maybe I want to say maybe three years ago um and we went for a hot chocolate and that was a really lovely kind of normal moment that I I kind of even while it was happening I thought I'm I know I'm going to treasure this moment because I don't know when when or if I see her again I guess the reason that I I want to talk about it is because since I've met a lot of adoptees through the London group and online I have realized that it's actually not that uncommon to have an adopted sibling who struggles in terms of um, addictions which my sister um, has experienced and other kind of issues I think that it was kind of helpful for me to as a you know not feel so alone and I have met you know a number of people who've had siblings who struggle who either who either are no longer part of the adoptive family or you know sadly aren't with us anymore so I know you've done a lot of therapy and a lot of writing and and work on yourself and dealing with adoption related issues Can you pinpoint something or say in words even why it's so important for you to persist with seeking your sister out in a variety of ways you don't have to go into, but and keeping up the relationships with your nieces and nephews? And do you relate that back to your original loss of your biological parents? You're probably onto something there, Hayley. So I would say that um, in personality, I'm very much like a border collie dog, you know, the sheep dogs. Um, So I like to kind of (laughs) run behind and check check in that everybody's, you know, all accounted for. Um, And I'm, yeah, my friends say I'm, I'm really loyal, but they do say that your what do they say your best characteristic is also you can flip it and it's your worst characteristic so whilst I'm very loyal I'm also quite um like a dog kind of clinging on and not not wanting to let go but I guess I don't want any of them to feel like that everybody gave up so I kind of want them to feel that they're important and they matter and you know I don't want to kind of be in their face all the time but if they ever need any info and I and I have it then of course I I wouldn't want them to to feel like they were kind of scraping around for information if I if I could help in any way and as I said you know I'm not a biological relative but you know I can tell them that she loved Nirvana and Tupac and she's way way cooler than I'll ever be she's got a great memory she's she was into gymnastics you know it's just stuff you're not going to you know, they're not going to read the, this on their files when they, you know, they hit 18, they go and get their files because I guess some of the, some of the people that worked with my sister saw her as a person, but not everybody did. Not all of the professionals really cared about her really or the children. It's just a job for them. And looking at this, um, as we kind of wrap up and we're going to do our recommended resources right away, looking at this from the UK perspective and you said before you found like the one support group (laughs) and you'd love to have more and how have you gotten involved with that and um, for any of our international listeners that are either near where you are or can you just talk a little bit about the supports you know about you mentioned Open Nest as a, a conference that you went to And just kind of give us a little Cliff's Notes version on what's kind of happening over there as far as adoptee support and things that maybe could have helped, you know, you and your sister when you were 
in that time of need. I wish that I could ramble on about all the millions of supports, but no, unfortunately, um, there's not much. <laughs> so what there is, is mostly kind of just set up by adoptees such as myself. So my friend Rachel, who does um, On Being Adopted, she um, has run a couple of yoga days and um, some just coffee meetups, things like that, which have been great. And really, you know, there's lots of people who are keen to get involved. And I'm sure that we will, you know, if people want to follow me and drop me a line, then I'll, I'll kind of add them to the list of people that are interested. I think we're going to need a bit of people power, maybe some funding. But, you know, we, the, the will is there, definitely. We've got the people. You know, it's just not a, a kind of adult adoptees is not a topic that people are particularly interested in or bothered about funding. Um, you know, we're kind of last last in the pile, really. The only organisation that really is doing stuff for, for adult adoptees is called the, it was called the Post Adoption Centre, so PAC UK. Uh, and they do, um, they're hoping to start a group very soon, which I'm hoping to lead for them. And they do, they do offer counselling, but it depends on where you live as to whether or not you can access any free or subsidised counselling. Uh, and they also have a really awesome advice line. So there are two numbers on their site um, that you can call in the UK. Uh, and if they if there's nobody available, they they always call you call you back. And that's all um, staffed by trained counsellors, uh, many of whom um, have experience with adoption or are themselves adopted. I did actually use that myself. I had, I think it was six sessions that were pro provided by my local authority when I was kind of towards the beginning of reunion when my bio dad hadn't yet told his children about me. So that was kind of a weird time for me. So I really, really benefited from, from them. Um, and that's kind of, there's kind of pockets, but they're the kind of main ones. But hopefully, yeah, if we speak again in a few years time, I hope to be able to give you a different answer. That's great. I love that there's more movement, you know, that's great. And and even knowing that there are some free supports is, is amazing. I will grab those links from you and make sure we share those in the show notes. So if you are in Claire's area, you can um, make use of those. And let's go ahead and do our recommended resources. It's, I mean, it's going to be no surprise that I'm going to recommend your blog, How to Be Adopted. If you guys are on Twitter, you absolutely have to be following Claire because she is top-notch Twitter content. I will say that. But your blog is so insightful. I love how you have a critical eye for topical things, but not just in the, you know, oh my gosh, this is so terrible, but it's critical. And also you give suggestions of things you can do to change things. And it's very, very well thought out. I feel like you're very well researched. And I also love that you've been including some guest posts lately. So that's been really special to hear from other adoptees who have different experiences from my own and, you know, learning from more uh, people that I wouldn't have necessarily seen otherwise. So I really, really appreciate you. You're such a gifted writer and it's just amazing to see the things that you've been doing and you soon, oh, should I say soon? What should I say? We'll be able to hear uh, Claire's beautiful accent on an upcoming podcast. Do you want to share about that? Sure. So my friend Joe and I um, are launching a podcast, How to Be Adopted podcast. I'm going to say, will it be this year? <laughs> It'll be soon. <laughs> so so um, yeah, so Joe is a, so he's actually a, a reporter. So he is really, really awesome at the interviewing side. And I guess he's going to be more, you know, interviewing kind of experts and academics. Um, and I'm hoping to do kind of more of the sort of human angle stories. And hopefully we'll make a really good, really good pairing. So yeah, watch this space. Wonderful. Um, so your blog is over at howtobeadopted.com if you want to find Claire's writing. And what do you want to recommend to us today? So I would love to recommend another podcast. Um, this is this is a UK podcast. It's called Loco Parentis, which is after the phrase 
in loco parentis, which means in place of a parent. So it's um, covering stories from people, anybody who is living, who grew up without their birth parents, so in a range of different situations. And it's led by a wonderful writer and comedian called Twina Main. And she is a transracial UK adoptee. She's black and she grew up in a white family. Uh, and she is, she's absolutely hilarious. She also has a comedy show on Radio 4 called Black Woman, which is absolutely hilarious. So, so she interviews a number of other transracial um, adoptees. Uh, and she also interviews a number of professionals in on the UK kind of adoption world. So if you're interested in learning any more about how um, the system works in the UK in terms of foster care and adoption and so on, then I would really recommend that you listen to those interviews with the, the, the experts and the professionals and yeah, give it a go. Oh, wonderful. And she also wrote a uh, guest post on your blog, I can see here. So you can check that out. I'm sure there's links over there too, to find that podcast. Yeah. So as a result of, uh, so following the Black Lives Matter movement, I asked her to do a takeover for me. So she did a week where she took over my social media, um, which was absolutely awesome. And I've got a few other people in the pipeline as well, which um, is really exciting. Oh my gosh. So many good things. Um, I'm so thankful for you, Claire. Where can we connect with you online? My Twitter handle is at how to be adopted. And I'm also on Instagram at how to be adopted. And you can email me how to be adopted at gmail.com. And you can find Claire's very, very cute logo um, in those places as well. <laughs> you laugh. I, you, you mentioned earlier you were on an adoptees, two adoptees off script episodes. And so that's a podcast I have for Patreon supporters. It's also weekly. So tell me how I have a life. I don't know. But Claire tells us about the backstory there and... Oh, yeah. So, so much good stuff. Thank you so much. I keep saying thank you, but I am very, very thankful for your voice and just how you have gone from in, totally in the fog to coming out and just working on yourself to just becoming this advocate who is just really helping make change, um, change maker. So well done, you. Thank you, Haley. It's been such an honor and a privilege. And you have changed so, so many lives. So thank you from all of us. Somehow there's always something extra inspiring to me when I hear of other adoptees just stepping up and filling in the gaps where there weren't supports before or there's more work needed in a certain area. I just, I love seeing fellow adoptees get in there and make things for the betterment of our adoptee community. So thank you, Claire, and thank you to you if that describes what you're doing. I am so grateful for my monthly supporters. Claire has been one for years and um, without which, you know, I wouldn't be able to do the show for you every single week. So if you want to um, be like Claire, if you want to support the podcast, if that's something that you think it's it's helpful it's been helpful in your life. It will help other adoptees as it grows larger and we find more adoptees who are not connected into the community. Um, if that feels important to you, then you can go to adoptiesoncom slash partner and find out the details of how you can support the show monthly. And one-time gifts are also very much appreciated and used right away <laughs> to cover costs of production and and all those fun behind the scenes things uh, to keep everything going. So thank you so much for considering that. I appreciate you partnering with me in that way, adoptiesoncom slash partner. And I just, I'm so, oh my gosh, there's so many good things coming up. We have another book to talk about next week with an adoptee author with her first, uh, her debut novel. And I think you're really going to love that interview also. Thanks so much for listening. Let's talk again next Friday. 